All right, my name is Ross Dix and I work for the Raincourse Conservation Foundation. And Raincourse is running this wolf school uh, in partnership with the Wolf Conservation Center in, in New York, who featured in our second episode. Uh, Raincourse work is all around protecting the, the land, waters and wildlife of coastal British Columbia. Uh, and we do lots of work to help conserve coastal wolves and wolves in British Columbia. And this whole series is really about helping you with the audience understand a little bit more about uh, the nature of wolves, the ecology of wolves and, and the issues that they face. Uh, last week, for those who, who were lucky enough to join, we, we had a whole session focused on indigenous perspectives and we were welcomed by Gabe George as a Tsleil-Waututh First Nation. Uh, so in our normal live events uh, in person, we would, we would have someone like Gabe provide a territorial acknowledgement uh, and in lieu of that, while we're live, I also just want to recognize that I'm calling in from uh, North Vancouver, which is the traditional territories and current territories of the Tsleil-Waututh, Musqueam and Squamish nations. Chris, I wonder if you could also just tell us where you're calling in from, from that perspective as well. You bet. So I'm in my office at the University of Victoria, uh, which is in the territories of the Lekongwen peoples, the Songhees and the Esquimalt, and also the Wasanich nation. Um, and quite lucky to be here. Yeah. Well, we're we're I'm I'm glad to to have you on for this last episode, Chris. Uh, so I'm going to give you everyone here a, a bit of a uh, introduction to Chris. Chris is a Raincourse Director of Science, and he also holds the Raincourse Chair in Applied Conservation Science at the University of Victoria. Uh, Chris and his team are trained in a whole range of different scientific schools around uh, ecology evolu and evolutionary ecology and also social sciences and, and really approach the work of the lab and, the, and conservation from a number of different uh, real world perspectives on conservation. Chris has published uh, dozens of papers, peer reviewed papers, including seminal works on the ecology of coastal wolves. Uh, collectively, I think Chris, um, Chris and, and increasingly his, his uh, colleagues and students at the, at, at the lab there are making a really significant contribution to coastal research and this bigger body of knowledge around, uh, that helps us understand the interface between species and habitats that bridge this divide between the land and sea, like the coastal wolves. Uh, since 2009, so over a decade now, Chris has led Raincourse Salmon Carnivore Programme which is really focused on understanding the relationship between of the relationship of rather bears, salmon and people in the Great Bear Rainforest. And it's really important to know and really, I guess, a feature of your work, Chris, that this is in partnership with different six indigenous nations on the coast, which is the Heltuk, Wiccano, Kisu, Heihe, Newhawk and Gitgat nations. And that study alone covers an area of over 22,000 square kilometers. Uh, Chris has been a recipient of numerous different awards. Uh, one that's, that's relevant to uh, someone we'll remember tonight was also a Compassion in Science Award from the International Fund for Wildlife Welfare, which was around the approach Chris took with Chester Starr to our original wolf research. And Chris has also received a Legacy Award from the University of Victoria and the Natural Science and Engineering Council. Uh, he was also re recognized more recently as a distinguished academic uh, from the Confederation of University Faculty Associations. I kind of read my notes squinting on the side here, Chris, so that's why I make these, uh, these strange faces. And then also, I think it was last year, I believe, from OceanWise, Chris, you received this Murray A. Newman Research Award for your work in conservation. Uh, and I'm, I'm sure as many people know, in addition to Chris's work, with their research and science and in, with the indigenous communities. He spends a lot of time uh, communicating this science both to people within the community and also the media. Uh, Chris also teaches undergraduate field courses and, and one in particular, Chris, that I know you're fond of is the work that you do around consilience with, which is a, is a course that you teach jointly with Jess Housty. And I think that that whole concept is one that I know you really champion this idea of blend in different ways of, of knowing, different types of knowledge, different types of learning. And in that respect, you're really, uh, I can speak for myself, you're definitely a mentor to me in understanding how we 
we really start to understand and think differently about our work in conservation, especially in regard to how we work with indigenous nations. And I know that's something that's felt by everyone within your lab and elsewhere. So welcome, Chris. Thank uh, you so much, Ross. Uh, yeah, you're welcome. Chris, we, we, like we'd mentioned like uh, in previous episodes, both with Paul and Heather, uh, a colleague, Chester Starr, who, who, who recently passed and, and who we kind of dedicated this whole uh, Wolf School to the memory of. And so I wanted to, to start, if it was okay, just to ask you if you could share a, a little of your story of your first day on actually your wolf research. And, uh, you know, one of these, uh, I just remember that I, I referred to it in my head as the uh, witch wolf story. And I wondered if you could start us off with just sharing that story of uh, Chester's question. I'll be happy to, uh, Ross. Thank you so much. Um, uh, yeah, this was a, a special story with a special man. And actually, maybe I'll ask you to show some pictures of yes. Chester oh, Star. Yeah. That's right. Thanks. Uh, for Chester that. was known as Lone Wolf uh, on the Marine VHF and is in his help sick or HASA community of Bella Bella. And for me and for many of us, in fact, Mr. Uh, Star was a teacher and a mentor. Uh, he was a father and a grandfather, uh, a loving husband, um, uh, a scientist in the field among us doing the very first wolf work on the coast. And, and uh, Chester walked on in uh, late August, and we miss him dearly. So we're, we're um, remembering him, taking some pause to remember dear Chester here tonight. Uh, I just want to point out one picture in particular, and that was with Jane Goodall in the bottom left corner. And that's on a very special evening when Chester was uh, given a great honor um, with uh, Jane present. And, and that's for me is one of the, the best memories outside of the field that I have with, with your Chester. But you've asked me to, to think back uh, to a very special story. And, and in fact, the story took place on the very first day that we spent time together in Heltic territory, in his territory. And we were two hours or less into our work um, of what had um, grown subsequently to become a, a 10 year or more project. And we had gone on our little boat about two hours north of Bella Bella in Helpstick territory. And uh, we began our work and before we did, we had a lunch, we dropped the anchor in this channel. And this channel was between an island to the west and a big chunk of the mainland to the east, which was much more mountainous. And you can kind of tell even from the channel that the mainland looks a lot more rugged. The trees look a little bit different compared to the west. The island on the west, less rugged. The trees look a little different and whatnot. And uh, over lunch, he asked me a question. And then especially at first, Chester um, uh, listened and watched more than he spoke. This was his way. and. Um, but when he did speak, he would um, ask interesting questions or, or share knowledge in very interesting ways or do both at the same time, as a matter of fact. So he asked me a question and it was kind of his way of teaching too. And he said, as he looked to the island and to the mainland, he looked at me, he said, what wolf are we studying? And I said, what do you mean? And he's like, well, are we studying the coastal wolves as he looked to the islands to the west or what he referred to as the timber wolves on the mainland? And at that time, uh, I admit I didn't know enough to really understand his question. To me, it seemed implausible or impossible that there would be two different types of wolves in this landscape. And this channel was, you know, 500 uh, uh, meters wide, quarter mile, half mile max wide. So, and we knew by that time already that, that wolves are really good swimmers. Um, 
But I asked him a little bit, what do you mean by that? And he said, well, we know, my people know that those are very different wolves from the mainland. Those are timber wolves, and very different from the island wolves. So I sat with that and asked him about that a few times over the years. And it encouraged a lot of our thinking about what sort of questions we would ask, what sort of ecological questions about these wolves, what kind of evolutionary questions about these wolves. And as it turned out, I mean, it took us about 10 years as scientists to come to the same place where Chester and his people already were in terms of their knowledge of differentiating between these island wolves, these coastal wolves, and, and the timber wolves, and that their ecology is fundamentally different on the islands. They're much more marine enriched animals. They're pretty much marine mammals on these islands. Whereas on the mainland, they're much more connected to their terrestrial or land-based food. And the differences are more than ecological, they're evolutionary or microevolutionary in that when we look at very specific evolutionary markers, molecular or genetic markers, we in fact can distinguish between wolves of the mainland in that coastal environment and wolves of, of the islands. So it was a real powerful early lesson um, that people like Chester, if in Chester and those in his community and in neighboring communities know an awful lot about their landscape, which of course makes sense. They co-evolved with this landscape um, over millennia. So that was a very special experience and a story that I, I really like to share. So thanks for asking. No, thank you. Uh, and for everyone who's interested, we do have, and we will we'll share like a, a dedication some of the memories of Chester uh, on our website for, for people to learn a little bit more about who he is and his influence in our work, which is, as you can tell, still very apparent. Chris, I also wanted to jump to another slide here before we dove into kind of the, the, the you know, discussing about current conservation of wolves in BC, just for you to kind of give us a sense of, and we'd asked this question of a couple of people, but it seems like you're also on who spent a lot of time in these places, just what it's like to experience uh, or share space with these coastal wolves? A great question, Rox. Um, to me, it, it's almost like stepping back in time as I imagine uh, a place to have been for centuries before industrialized, European colonial models of resource extraction started impacting landscapes and animals in what we now call North America. Um, one thing, I, I, as I was finding some photos today that jumped out at me at, with this photo, is you can see that this animal's muzzle is kind of white. And, and this, as, as the wolf enthusiasts among us will know, is a sign, like, like me actually, that, that this wolf is getting on in age. And, and we've got a bunch of photos from the area in which that white muzzle or, or what generally graying pelage is actually really common. I remember sharing this, some of these photos with a scientist from uh, the north. Uh, of the Great Bear Rainforest, a uh, member of the Alaska Department of Fish and Game, a research scientist, and he said, wow, so many of these pictures show a wolf with a gray muzzle. And he said something really striking. He said, our wolves don't live that long up here in Southeast Alaska to reach that age and show the wisdom of, of their, their life experience is very visibly in the pelage. So that, that there is still a place on the planet that supports essentially uh, a context, an ecological and human context in which for the most part, wolves can live as they have lived for millennia and, and enjoy some of their more mature sunsetting years and for which um, they may provide very good value to their pack mates and, and families and whatnot. So, so that, that's how I'd answer that, that it, it's spending time with these animals in these places, it's a little bit for me like stepping back in time. Mm. 
And I'm not, I know you showed a few pictures. I wanted to share this one and I'm kind of thinking of another one that kind of really influenced the, the, not the logo, but the image for your, for your, uh, for, your, for, for the whole uh, lab there at UVic. And so I'm kind of curious yeah. if you could tell us about, I suspect there's a story behind this wolf as well. Sure, uh, there's a great story. I, I, I like this image a lot. In, in fact, um, we, my now wife and I, Allison, were um, living in Bella Bella at the time. This would have been 2007 and we are both surfers. And we took off on our little, little boat a couple hours south to an outer coastal island. Uh, for a surfing weekend. And we had dragged our boards and even water because it was a very flat island with not much water at the time to the outer west coast with the surf crashing on this beautiful beach. And we had just dropped our tents and our surfboards and our water and everything and, and sat down. And at the moment we sat down, uh, this beautiful wolf, a female came trotting out of the forest to the south. and and. And as they often do in this environment, um, they or she came up uh, to us at you know 100 feet or so, and and came for a sniff, came for a look, and uh, so I had a camera nearby, and this was the very first wolf that my now wife had ever seen. So that holds a special place in in my heart and her heart, of course. And I think maybe the next photo here uh, shows. Uh, yeah, that's right. Um, uh, profile shot of her trotting as, as she left us to go on with her early evening and, and uh, did a little Photoshop work to take that image and flip it around and she's become the emblem for Raincoat's Applied Conservation Science Lab um, here at UPIC. So some 13 or 14 years later, she, um, she is still with us. Hmm. I'm just going to stop the share here one second and see if I can Get back to you now, one second. Okay, there we go. Thanks for that, Chris. Thanks for sharing those images. Mm -hmm. uh, and it seems like it's it's great context to start like this bigger question of understanding like what are the issues for uh, you know conservation issues facing uh, wolves in British Columbia, Columbia more broadly. And uh, I'd kind of love for you to also speak to a piece that you reminded me of earlier on in, in, in our chats uh, that really relates to this wildlife we welfare ethic that Raincourse holds is that regardless of wolves' ability to adapt to human pressures, that we need to focus on the welfare of individuals. So I'm kind of curious in that context, the re almost regardless of the, the state of populations of, of wolves in BC, as much as we do or don't know that, what, yeah. what are some of the key issues that are kind of affecting them, them right now? Sure. Sure. Um, maybe starting broadly, and you referred to it, wolves are amazing, especially among the large carnivores, because they do have an innate ability to respond numerically to heavy, heavy persecution uh, with high hunting pressures, trapping pressures, fling, um, and all sorts of, of other um, things that, that humans do to wolves. They have this remarkable ability when there's fewer wolves, those remaining wolves have more food to eat, eat on average, and the females can produce an awful lot of pups and sometimes there's two breeders in, in a family group or a pack, so they can respond numerically very quickly. And, and um, on one hand, that is true. On the other hand, what we found is that throughout a great part of the world, we've lost wolves. And, uh, within that space, um, they won't be coming back soon or ever. There is simply too high a human footprint, too many people around, and there's not the, the social tolerance that, that, that wolves need to occupy landscapes. So generally, they need, they need food. They need a lot of space to find that food, and they need freedom from persecution, from exploitation, killing. Uh, despite their ability to replenish themselves at, at a population level. They're making some remarkable recoveries, either aided by humans or not, in, in parts of North America and Europe, some really impressive, hopeful stuff. And why it makes me hopeful is because a lot of that is 
is grown or permitted by increased human tolerance. So these things are, are really good. Um, in BC, we have some of these very same issues. We have, um, in particular, wolves reclaiming space that they were shut out of over the uh, 20th century in particular, uh, and across several waves of very intense persecution, bounties, aerial gunning, aerial um, distribution of, of some really nasty poisons and, and they've reclaimed and are reclaiming some space. Um, there are probably very few, there are probably more areas in BC where wolves are reclaiming than, than blinking out. Um, that being said, there are a lot, an awful lot of individual wolves within the BC population that perish um, every year. And, and in my view, and in the view of a great many people, they, they perish um, for reasons that, that are hard to justify for in the name of, for example, recreational killing or killing under the guise that killing them will help ungulate population, hoofed animals, deer, elk, moose, caribou, uh, respond to what people believe might be reduced uh, wolf populations from from um, their efforts, um, but and you mentioned it, and we should give pause to those individuals that lose their lives and the the types of suffering they can endure uh, during that loss of life. This is something that that not enough biologists, in my view, recognize and appreciate that that almost uniformly biologists and conservation biologists among them think of population health or the health of a species or a population exclusively at the population level. How many are they, are there? And that's their relatively narrow focus and in a way that's always been the focus. But increasingly people are, and scientists among them, ethicists, members of the public and more are recognizing that individuals comprise those populations and we ought to care about them for a number of reasons. Um, but we'll come to the ethics very shortly, but, but ecologically individuals might be important in terms of some of the specific roles and niches they occupy within populations. Socially individuals might be very important in that they have knowledge. Older one, older animals in particular carry knowledge with them and in a culturally sophisticated social animal like wolves, these older animals can be very important in, in, um, in cultural transmission of knowledge that can be very useful at a population level. So there's an ecological and a social reason. Evolutionarily, individuals might be awfully important. We know and we are increasingly appreciating how important genetic diversity is. And you can kind of think about genetic diversity in a population as the keys that open the doors to the future. Doors that may be closed to populations by climate disruption or novel diseases, et cetera. And individuals in a population have different, have genetic variation, just like you and I are different, Ross. Um, and when you start removing individuals from a population, uh, just through what we refer to as sampling error, you may remove unique, pieces of the genome with it that exists in individuals among that population that might be those keys that help open the doors to the future. So, so I've given you just one of several ecological, social, and evolutionary reasons why we, we should get some thought, even if we're only interested at the population level, we should get some thought as to why individuals are also important to consider. Mm. I also believe, and, and many would agree, that individuals have inherent worth. Uh, we know that having the very same physiology as you or, or me, uh, that they can feel pain and suffering. And a lot of the ways that wolves are exploited um, can cause tremendous suffering, tremendous suffering, whether, whether those animals die 
or not. And we should give thought to that. Um, we, should, we do in other domains. There are laws that, that for example, um, restrict how we treat our domestic or farm animals that are, are designed to reduce suffering. And we should give pause to that. And we should consider the suffering that these forms of exploitation can impose, then we should inspect those costs when we are, or here's my hand, when we are um, thinking about the benefits to the hunting in, in this example. And whereas most of society and clearly not all of the society will in fact support or, or even vigorously support the idea of hunting for food, hunting animals like deer or elk or moose for food, very, very few people very few people uh, support the idea of killing and causing suffering along the way for things like trophy or perceived population control. So, so that's what I think about, in fact, the most when I think about wolves being exploited. Yeah, and it's like, that's one of the pieces I wanted to talk about is just that distinction and like we I think we, we try and make it clear that a rainforest as an organization is not opposed to to hunting but we are opposed to trophy hunting uh, and one of the pieces that I'm sure you know but I'm kind of saying this mainly for our audience is one of the ways in which we are uh, working to to conserve and protect wolves is and this was born out of a strategy to protect uh, was a focus on grizzly bears was buying the rights to the commercial hunt i.e buying the rights for for non-residents to to trophy hunt grizzly bears but at the same time we were buying the rights to for for uh not for residents but for commercial trophy hunters coming in from outside of the country to also shoot wolves and now fortunately we're we're slowly acquiring all those rights throughout the great bear rainforest which we're, we're very happy about and we can we're, we're still not there so we will share more information about that but I was wondering Chris could you tell us a little bit about like I know it's difficult to understand the scale but just the nature of that type of activity on, on and, and how that might affect wolves in, in somewhere like the Great Bear Rainforest because it may be that like as I understood it sometimes people may be going in you know previously with a specific target for a trophy animal like a grizzly bear it's almost as if they were they were getting wolves as you know like almost like a a bonus animal, and I, I, I only yeah. use that word because I've seen it used as such. I yeah, sure. yeah. And I'm cu curious if you could just give us a sense of, uh, because that doesn't, fortunately, in many jurisdictions in the world, that activity is now illegal uh, for obvious reasons. I'm just wondering if you could give us, give us a sense about how tro like commercial trophy hunting might affect wolves in somewhere like the Great Bear or on the coast of BC. Sure, sure. Even, even, you know, at the province scale, the, the data are, are somewhat rough because the data collection by the province is not, uh, in most cases, in most parts of the province, not very detailed. Uh, but, the, you know, course estimates are, are somewhere just north of 1,000, 1,200 animals, wolves a year, individuals a year are killed in, in the province of British Columbia. Um, Specifically on the coast, it's, it's, it's murkier yet, uh, but my feeling on the order of, of certainly dozens, maybe more per year, depending on the area and how, how east we go to count uh, the coast. But, um, you know, there is certainly suffering along the way. Uh, and, you know, you talked about non-resident hunters. I want to explain what that means a little bit yeah. more so people understand. So. So there are resident hunters uh, that uh, live in BC and then those from abroad need a guide outfitter to, to hunt in, in, uh, in BC. And, and the part of the great irony and the, the sad irony is that many of those who come to kill wolves and up until recently grizzly bears, black bears, mountain lions and more in British Columbia come from areas of the world that used to have wolves but no longer have wolves. Mm -hmm. and, and for me that's, that's striking and a, and a sad irony and, and, and reinforces for me how um, 
conservation economic solutions like this with a willing buyer, willing seller are a very nice way to directly intervene in what we think is uh, unethical, um, potentially ecologically reckless um, activity in a very special place. And, and although it's not my, um, not my place to say, but our, my understanding, clear understanding is that that, that sort of trophy hunting is, is not embraced by the rights and title holders of our coast, the indigenous peoples of our coast, who in fact were instrumental in, in banning the grizzly bear hunt on the coast. Yeah. And someone's asked a question. I just didn't want to ignore it because it is an important question about sure. uh, that, you know, more recently, some nations are, you know, in, uh, uh, Get a, have a different stance on predator management and like generally you know like w we focused on what we comment on with regards to the nations that we work with on the course as opposed to you know uh discussing what other nations that we you know don't don't have the same kind of relationship with yeah. might, might choose to do and that might be yeah. you know that might be uh, a very different approach to predator management than than we take so I just I wasn't sure if you wanted to address that or not Chris like I guess like I like I know that we tend to focus on discussing work with nations with whom we actually have a relationship as we're, yes, work, we're yes, working yes. With rather than those that we don't yes, but if yes. you feel like you want to add something to that then please do I didn't want to ignore the question but I know it's a yeah, tricky no, I, think, I think it's a fair one and, and to be honest I expected that I can probably guess who the person who asked the question was, I won't name any names, but, uh, but it's a good one. Um, yeah, clearly uh, nations are, indigenous nations of our coast and beyond are, are sovereign uh, governments that are entitled to um, manage resources as they see fit. Um, it doesn't mean that I have to necessarily agree, just as I may not agree with, uh, public policy of, of France these days, or the United States for that matter. Um, and I recognize that, that they have these inherent rights to manage wildlife as they see fit. And so that's my, my particular view on that. Um, I, I noticed that a lot of people that look like me, settler uh, hunters or, or scientists really like to point out divergent viewpoints of, of some uh, Indigenous nations, and, and I think I know why they do that, and, and that's fine. Uh, and I, I do recognize that there's this diversity, um, but I, I, I maintain my, my statement um, about, on the coast at least, by and large, um, this is not a practice that's embraced culturally. But again, I'm not an expert in that field, um, but this is my understanding, my clear understanding of the way things are, at least in, in the areas in which I work. Okay, thank you. Thanks for that. And uh, we, will we will try and get to most of the questions. We probably won't get to all of them, but I just wanted to ask a couple of other ones. Uh, some of them aren't necessarily related to that topic, but I just want to be complete. So sure. a question that was asked twice is, are gray wolves and timber wolves the, the same? Well, the same, basically, that's the question. That, a great question. So often we hear a lot of um, uh, common names for, for many wildlife species. And then what they share in common is a Latin name, a genus and a species name. Uh, Canis lupus together, for example, and, and so wolves on our coast, be they what are locally referred to as timber wolves or coastal wolves or rainforest wolves, um, they are all gray wolves as, as we know them generally. Um, but again, between those two different types of wolves, we can think of them as types of gray wolves. They're, they're very different ecologically and very different um, in a microevolutionary sense, with, in terms of the divergence in in their genetic um, signatures. Yeah. Okay. And then I was going to move on to another topic that we've kind of touched on a little bit, which is about this whole discussion and debate around wolves and and, and caribou and uh, like 
brain courses long, you know, for a long time, uh, advocated against the use of wolf calls as a, as a management tool and and uh, and their use ostensibly to support what we took discussed, for example, the declining caribou uh, right. populations. Uh, and Chris, I was like, the, the, in a way, there's this kind of like there's 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 this there's kind of a simple logic, right? In, in some way. Uh, that okay, wolves predate on caribou. To, that's one of the prey species. Uh, some of those populations of caribou are gone ex extinct. Therefore, we can we can justify killing these animals because another population is going extinct. Right. And I know we we kind of question that premise. I just wondered if you could say a little bit more about that. I know we've you've published some recent research that that looks particularly at like how effective wolf control is in caribou and caribou recovery but i just wondered if you could talk to that a little bit more broadly about some of the reasons we don't don't agree with that premise or that 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 as a, a like the rationale that that wolf calls can be justified as a tool to to protect mm -hmm. endangered caribou mm -hmm. yeah uh, the, the way i look at this is there's there's two questions to ask um, one's a scientific question and that is does it work and the other question is an ethical one. Mm -hmm. uh, if we assume it might work, should we do this? Should we do this? That, that's not a scientific question. That's a, that's a question of, of, of values and ethics. Uh, uh, and public policy often draws on both those domains about how the world works and how people think the world should work. Um, so let's, let's also do that in, in our discussion here. So yeah, it, it's, it's seductive logic that, you know, if wolves eat a prey species and if you kill wolves, well, there's gonna be more prey species. That, that simple sort of uh, uh, arithmetic almost. Um, however, uh, the, the the science on on predator control in general is extraordinarily varied. Um, the science on wolf control in particular is likewise varied. There's some evidence in some particular context with some particular population. Um, it might have helped. It's very difficult, especially when you look at a population at a time. That, or even a handful that were subject to wolf control or not, and measuring the responses or potential responses of caribou following those periods of wolf control. It's very difficult uh, statistically to um, find a strong signal uh, of wolf control. And, and there's several reasons for that. I mean, caribou and, and other uh, animal populations are influenced by a great many factors from the bottom up, what they eat, what they can eat, what is available um, uh, in terms of competition, which, with what other animals are they in competition for those resources? And then they're uh, influenced by the top down about who eats them and how they die, for example. So wolves are one of, of a handful of predators, a few predators in, in most of, of caribou range and, and the work that, that we did and that was published this, this previous summer re-examined uh, the findings of a very influential paper uh, written by some, some scholars from Western Canada, some very productive, uh, by all measures, uh, successful and, and gifted scholars that that came to the conclusion across 18 or I think 18 wolf populations, some of which were subject to wolf control, some of them not, plus some other interventions. Their conclusion from the way they did their analysis is that wolf control and maternal penning of, of caribou had a measurable effect on those caribou populations for which those, those um, interventions were exercised. And, and statisticians uh, among us and our group that looked at those data uh, subsequently a year or two later came to a different conclusion. So getting too technical, uh, um, 
paused and and remembered to include a very important statistical step in this analysis. And what we found is that the, the signal for the efficacy or the usefulness of wolf control and maternal pinning, um, the evidence was lacking. It, it, those interventions that seemed statistically performed no better than doing nothing at all, no better than considering no treatments among those populations. So um, it was, in my view, important and transformative, uh, a wake up call to uh, managers and scientists who have been wondering um, what to do with caribou. And, and this seems like a simple solution, throw predator control at this desperate, desperate issue of, that is the decline of, of in this case, woodland caribou and boreal car, uh, caribou. For me, I think the biggest issue here, Ross, is when we focus so narrowly on something for which the evidence is pretty scant that it works, we do so um, at the expense of foregoing other interventions, other more difficult interventions. For example, safeguarding the habitat for caribou. Some might argue it's far too late in the game to do this. We need emergency measures right now. Our data question that. Our data question the efficacy of these emergency interventions. At the same time, there are now excellent data, excellent studies showing that during periods of wolf control in the last decade or more, and in particular in the last five years, uh, the destruction in particular of the Southern Mountain Caribou habitat has gone on essentially unabated with um, uh, highly touted um, uh, protected areas packaged that are a relative uh, drop in the bucket compared to what caribou have needed over the last century. Um, and, you know, just last week, there was more, wasn't data, was more GIS imagery and forest development plan inspections showing even more, not just caribou habitat, but beautiful, critical uh, caribou habitat disappearing from chainsaws. Uh, on the chopping block, so to speak, um, right next to areas where there have been and will continue to be actually some impressive restoration efforts. So just a few a stones throw away, a raven fly away. Um, more of this irreplaceable old growth forest with which these caribou have evolved is disappearing. So we needed to have made strong decisions decades ago, and we still need to be making those decisions now to preserve what is left as it is a fraction and not focusing on an apparent solution uh, for which evidence is poor. Um, that's my view, and that's um, certainly not a consensus view. There are conservation scientists, maybe some of those are, are tuning in right now that may disagree with me, um, but we're very, proud of this work, um, um, believe that, that managers ought to take it seriously, and some are, we've got some very good feedback from this work. Um, and I don't want a, a future in which caribou are gone either. I want my daughters to see caribou one day. Um, so um, lots to think about there, lots to unpack there. And is this like I know we try and is this this paper is open access as well? Like I think we linked to it already on our site, and I think it's linked yeah. on the, the lab site, and we can share those links and so on for sure. people who can digest the information and continue the, the you know the discussion as it were. Sure. Yeah. There's there's an I wanted to take another question here because sure it was kind of interesting uh, as all of them are. So thank you for please do keep posting. We we do we are going to make a little bit of extra time for questions at the at the end. So. So do keep posting them. And someone is asking, Isabel is asking, so thank you, Isabel. Shouldn't coastal wolves be se a separate group and being marine mammals given a special protection like spirit bears? 
Oh, interesting. Uh, really great question. Yeah, often government affords some special um, protection to animals that are unique and different. And, and I'll sort of rewind the tape a little bit here. And, and when I referred to especially these outer coastal wolves as marine mammals, I do so somewhat tongue in cheek, um, you know, but, but drawing on the reality that polar bears, for example, um, are technically considered marine mammals because they make almost exclusively uh, their living from marine resources and they live in a marine environment on ice floes for, for most of their, their waking hours. Um, the wolves are, are not too dissimilar to that, especially on the outer coastal islands when, where they may be making, our data suggests, 75, 90% of their living, their protein molecule by molecule from marine resources and occupying um, these islands and the intertidal zones and the waterways uh, among these islands um, uh, that they swim. Um, and in a way, they are afforded protection, not maybe by our provincial government, but by the people with whom these wolves share space with, with the coastal First Nations people um, that have, by um, holding strong and even stronger year by year against resource extraction industries that may take too many of those marine resources, that may want access to those old growth temperate rainforests, which grow other wolf food. They support an abundant black-tailed deer population on which wolves also depend. So in a way they are afforded protection by virtue of, of occupying this very special uh, place on the coast. That being said, there are people from the outside of these forests that come in to, to uh, hunt these wolves. And I think that's, uh, entirely um, uh, addressable with with um, guide outfitter bios that I'm, I'm sure we'll discuss soon. Yeah, there's a couple of questions, but I did want to get to that, and I also just I wonder if you could just share. You touched on it there, and like I think like this aspect of you know what we call a recreational killing. So that like we see that as kind of distinct from trophy hunting. Uh, and the, like, and I wondered if you could give us a sense, like you, you kind of referred to it there, that we're kind of calling it like recreational killing. So that's resident hunters within British Columbia who can who can shoot wolves for you know, in some places multiple wolves throughout the year. Uh, and in many in many cases, I remember Paul telling me this, but certainly for coastal wolves, in a situation where there isn't really much of an economic imperative in terms of utilizing the fur and so on because of the nature of it. So I'm just wondering if you could give us a sense of, of, of what we understand that recre recreational killing of wolves uh, to be like in terms of the scale of it. Yeah, um, I mean, and again, the, the data are, are pretty undetailed, especially for the coast. And, and that's right, there's not a, a real um, uh, committed um, trapping uh, community, it, it's too warm at our latitudes, even uh, in throughout the Great Bear Rainforest to attract um, the economic incentive that, that trappers use. And, and, and but in there, I also include people that, that trap for cultural reasons. In my observations on the coast in the last couple of decades, there's just not a lot of trapping. Um, so the hunting in BC, most of the ways that, that wolves die is yeah, I think recreational is, is a good way uh, to describe it. Um, these aren't men or women bringing home food for their table. They're not feeding their families with wolves, of course. They are, um, in some cases, feeding their egos um, or feeding perhaps their, their dislike of wolves because, let's face it, there may be many wolf enthusiasts uh, on this planet, but there's a sizable number of people that simply don't like wolves for, for reasons um, that are varied. And I, I, I suspect um, and have some um, evidence and observations that from, for example, online hunting forums in which people express reasons why they, they kill wolves and it's, it's for perceived influence on 
on prey populations. They think they may be helping the local elk or, or deer, uh, moose, et cetera. They may dislike wolves and that's what they do and have been taught to do is kill wolves on sight. And some do it sadly because they think it's fun. Mm. And, and for me and for many people, and there's really good sociological data, polling data from throughout North America, suggests that, that those reasons don't fit well with people. Um, because I think they have, they can do the moral calculus really easy, really easily. They can come to an understanding that that doesn't feel right to them, that, that an animal would be killed, not, not, not for food, which is generally very well accepted, but instead for recreation, dislike, perceived population control or, or trophy. And like, I just, can you give us a sense of how much that actually costs to do? Because I kind of found, I know that number can sometimes vary year on year, but I don't know if you know the current number for the cost of a wolf tag, where that's required. Um, I believe, unless it's changed recently, it's the only big game animal uh, for which you don't need a specific species tag. You don't need a wolf tag. I, I don't believe so. Or if you do, it's very low value, like five or seven dollars or something. Compared to anything else, big and furry, if you want to kill it, be it a mountain lion or a moose for that matter, there's specific licenses, species licenses for hunters. But um, as, a, as a legacy, and, and, and I mean a decades old legacy of, of, of wildlife management built on an incomplete understanding of the value of, of wolves and other top predators, um, they were, and by all intents and measures here, especially this measure with species license fee, um, wolves are not particularly valued members of the ecological com community, the managers, or at least individuals aren't. Uh, and they, they uh, assume that, you know, we don't have to track the, the, the killing of wolves too carefully because they're really good at, at rebounding. Um, so it's that narrow uh, demographic, human-centric uh, legacy of wildlife management of the 1980s and 50s. Well, man, it, this is ancient stuff that is still sadly with us yeah and i'm just we're, we're getting so please keep asking questions here we're getting uh more limited on time here so i did people are asking about the ways in which we conserve wolves and i want to re reiterate the, the what rain course is currently doing so in terms of ending non-resident hunting on wolves in the great bear rainforest we're continuing to buy uh commercial hunting tenures so we now own five and we're looking to buy one in the Kitlop tenure where I think we need another just over two hundred thousand dollars to buy the the rights in, in the Kitlop tenure which is in in I guess uh, the northern coast of British Columbia uh, and just so people know once we buy those rights we own them in perpetuity and uh, a long-term uh, goal is to transfer those rights to the to the nations in who, whose territories they lie so in this case it's a and Axula and the Heisler Nation, and we can share more information on that. So that's what we're doing to end commercial trophy hunting of animals on the coast of British Columbia, particularly the Great Bear Rainforest. And then with regards to the recreational kill, it's kind of interesting because obviously within the last couple of days, we know that we're going to have a, a, a provincial elections. And still we have a you know tool on our website where you can express your your support for the an end to recreation of killing of, of wolves in throughout British Columbia. Um, Chris, I'm, I'm kind of curious. I wanted to ask you another question that was slightly different. Like, right. I, 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 we've still got time for a couple more. Uh, there, there are solutions to, 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 to protection of wolves. We can end commercial trophy hunting by acquiring rights in certain areas. We can have policy changes that would end recreation killing of wolves, right? And um, I don't presume to be naive to think that's going to be an easy task, right? It took it's taken Raincoast and many other groups, especially uh, with support from coastal First Nations and others, you know, well over two decades to end grizzly hunting, uh, and so ending of, of and complete protection of wolves in British Columbia is likely going to be a long time in coming. 
I'm, but I'm kind of curious, this is kind of a different question, is in 20 years of research and all that time you've spent with Chester and others uh, researching wolves, what, what do you think, what lesson do you think that wolves might have for human beings? Like we often study their cult, their, their nature, their interaction as part of the reason why so many people like them. But I'm kind of curious as what you might say is if, if wolves had a lesson for human beings, what might it be? Wow. Um, yeah, that's, that's a great, that's a great question, uh, Ross. I think um, wolves can teach us a lot. I mean, uh, they are uh, animals committed to family and what a great value that is. Mm -hmm. uh, they have very sophisticated division of labor and expertise. I mean, who doesn't want to develop expertise? I think that's kind of cool. Uh, there's cultural transmission of knowledge. That's something that we value absolutely. Um, we respond, or they respond rather to um, cues from the environment uh, and their prey, at least at a population level over time, they adjust what the environment throws at them. And that's the lesson that humans would be wise to keep. And clearly we're not doing that. Um, they could teach us that if you're gonna kill something, uh, there better be a good reason for it. Wolves do not kill for fun or for trophy. Uh, they, they kill to feed themselves and their family. And for me, and, and as a hunter myself, that's, that's a value that, that um, resonates really strongly with me. Um, uh, and in a way, you know, it boils down to some specifics or some general ideas actually about how to protect wolves and some lessons we can learn from wolves that they are kind of like us in that to take care of them as we would take care of people, we provide them a home, right? We provide them food, or at least not intervene in, in the pursuit of the basics. And then we provide them security, simple. Home, and by that I mean habitat. Food, by that I mean things like deer and salmon on the coast and security, freedom from exploitation. It's, it's really pretty basic stuff, but it, it does ask a lot from humanity. Um, I wanna to return to something about, you know, how we can best protect wolves. And there are clearly very direct lines to saving the lives of individual wolves and, and some amazing solutions there. I, I also don't want us, or, neither us nor others to forget that a lot of work that Raincoast has done over the years has been uh, in service of these incredible ancient temperate rainforests for habitat that grow deer in this case, that grow black-tailed deer and, and maintain healthy populations of black-tailed deer on which these wolves make a lot of their living, especially in mainland areas, especially when salmon aren't uh, in, in those waters. The work that we do in restoring salmon habitat um, or arguing for increased or a recognition of allocating some salmon and other marine resources for wildlife. That's another way we can help wolves and have directed a lot of our efforts over the last two centuries. Two centuries. Feels like it sometimes, decades. Um, uh, that taking care of the home of habitat, taking care of the food, especially marine resources and science and service of the protection of those things for wolves at a population level. And, and one task that's actually within grasp is, is, is providing the, the security that some individual wolves require in certain areas um, who lives are cheapened uh, and, and taken um, for what? For, for the whims of people who want to hunt these animals, not to eat them, but for their um, sense of pleasure, recreation, trophy. Um, and, and that doesn't sit well with 
many people and there's a clear solution here. So that's why I'm, I'm, I'm really proud to, to support and advocate for this wonderful solution. Yeah. Well, thanks. We're, we're, we're kind of at time. So I want to do some closing here. It's, it's only a couple sure. of minutes, so we will we'll do that properly. Uh, sure. Just for the guests that we haven't answered all the questions and we, it, it's almost impossible to do that. So just recognize that from the beginning. Sure. Uh, we will send like more materials and, and endeavor to have more materials on our website. We are considering doing another series because we know there's so much to cover and, and we feel this is a important topic you know wolves have always been a key focus of raincourse work for lots of reasons and we are not going to be moving away from our campaigns to protect them i think we can just say period uh so just watch this space in that regard i also wanted to do some thank yous here so uh chris thank you to you for making the time i know you're busy as a uh, a scholar and a father and a lot more. So I appreciate you taking the time and your passion and energy and sharing this and your dedication to this work. It's, it is inspiring to, to me and I know lots of others. So thank you for that time. Thank you, Ross. Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you to all of you who've joined us tonight and in previous sessions, we really appreciate your time and to all our other guests who have, uh, yeah, thanks to all of our other guests and speakers who have participated over these last few weeks uh, and our partners, the Wolf Conservation Centre, have really helped us in terms of spreading the word and, and hosted us for the second episode of Wolf School. And I guess it kind of seems fit in to also say thank you to the wolves. I have a kind of, it's not a big reveal, I have a, a, a beautiful wolf image uh, that was taken by a friend of ours, April Bentz. Uh, and it, it kind of feels fitting to thank the wolves for inspiring us to do this work because it, it does, you're right, Chris, it can feel like centuries of work and it likely will take centuries of work, uh, but they inspire, inspire us sufficiently that we'll still be doing this work. Uh, it's certainly in decades to come. So thanks to everyone for participating. We will make all, this session available online and uh, hopefully our future sessions to keep exploring this topic uh, and thanks once more to you, Chris. And I think we're going to close tonight. Uh, Chris, maybe I know we're a little bit over time, but I just wondered if there's anything else like we've done this is if there's a resource or a place where other people can go to find information beyond the Wolf Conservation Center or Rain Coast, where else might people, where else might you send people to learn a little bit more about wolves? Well, in terms of online, I can't think of any two better places than you've mentioned, Ross. Uh, the only thing I'll add to that is if you are lucky enough to live near wolves or among them that uh, within reason, uh, sharing space with them at respectful distances, for me, that, that fills my cup. And, and I hope everyone, at least once in their lives, has, has the great privilege to do that. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Okay, with that, we'll close and uh, thank you everyone for participating. And yeah, Chris, I will speak to you soon and yeah, take care, everyone. Thank you. And uh, it's good night from us. Good Thanks night. Take care. Good night, everybody. Bye bye.